Hi, for this video, what I want to do is show you how to perform a two sample t test for independent samples using the TI Inspire graphing calculator to help find the p value and some other calculations. So, with this, before I start, I know that I told you that I'm doing a two sample t test, but um, during a test or a quiz or when you're doing your homework, you have to be able, or even in the real world, you have to decide which um, hypothesis test you need to perform. So, I want to first First, start by telling you um, some things to look for and just know that different textbooks have different assumptions and conditions listed so some of the ones that I write down may not show up in your textbook they might be slightly different so I do advise strongly that you look at your textbook all right so let's read through the problem that we have a pet store claims that the mean annual cost for routine vet visits are the same for cats and dogs the mean cost for random samples of the two types of pets are shown below Assume the population is normally distributed and the variances are not equal. At alpha equals 0 0.05, can you reject the pet store's claim? Okay, um, so with this, the reason that we know it's a two sample t-test is because we're talking about two different samples or two different um, creatures, in this case, cats and dogs. And we're trying to see if the mean annual cost for routine vet visits are the same. Um, these would be independent samples because cats and dogs um, do not have anything to do with each other. A cat is independent of a dog. Um, the cost for the cat would have nothing to do with the cost for the dog. Okay, um, so with this one, when you have two samples and you're dealing with the mean, so it's talking about the mean, which remember um, we use the um, the symbol mu from the Greek alphabet to represent mean for when we're setting up our null and our alternative hypotheses. Um, there are two types of tests that can be performed for the mean when you have two samples. One is the two sample t test and the other one is the two sample z test. The difference between the two is what type of variance or what kind of standard deviation you know. So in this case, um, because we know the sample standard deviation and not the population standard deviation, that leads us to using a t-test, okay? Um, so since sigma, which is the population standard deviation, are unknown, we use t. Okay, so you use the t distribution if you don't know the population standard deviations. You use the z or the normal distribution if you know the population standard deviation. So that's the first one. Um, for any type of hypothesis test, it's always important to have a random sample. So it does tell us that we have random samples. Okay, that tries to help control bias, even though bias may still be present. Um, random samples do help control that. And then the last one is that you either, in order for the central limit theorem to kick in, you either have to have populations, or I mean, sorry, samples that are greater than or equal to 30, or you have to have a population that is normally distributed. So since it tells us to assume the population is normally distributed, that's what we are going to do. So it says to assume population is normally distributed. So the conditions are met, so we would use a two sample t test is the name of the test. Um, if you have dependent samples, you would use um, basically a t test for the differences. Um, I will address that in another video, but for the any time that you have independent samples um, and you have two samples, you use a two sample t test. So now let's set up our null and our alternative. Okay, our null and our alternative come from the claim. So the claim is that the vet costs, the mean annual vet costs are the same for cats and dogs. So there's two ways that you can set it up and depending upon your textbook, um, there's two different ways that they may teach you to do that. Since they're saying that there is no difference, that basically means that mu one equals mu two. So you can either set it up as the difference between the two, mu1 minus mu2, is equal to zero, 
or we could say that mu1 equals mu2. So basically, if I read this, this would be there is no difference between the means. So this is going to be our claim, which is important to help us interpret our decision. Okay, the alternative is always the complement. Remember that with this, um, if it has equality, it goes in the null. If it has inequality, it goes in the alternative. So the alternative would be mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to zero, or you could say that they are not equal. Okay, um, we're going to use the important information from here. Okay, um, when we are setting this up, we do need to know our degrees of freedom, and our degrees of freedom are always going to be um, the sample size, the smaller of n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to look for your smaller sample size, which is 20. And so our degrees of freedom for this one is 19. And with this one, I am not going to pool. I forgot to mention that up here. Um, if the variances are not equal, this tells us don't pool the results. You can only pool the results if the variances are equal. It's always safer to err on the side of don't pooling. Your calculator will ask you if you want to pool or not pool. So if the variances are not equal, don't pool. Okay, um, so that's why these are the degrees of freedom. If you were pooling, the degrees of freedom is found by a different method, which I will discuss in another video. Okay, so when we draw this out, remember that the tail of the test is always going to be dependent on the alternative hypothesis. So this one right here is not equal, so this tells us that we are going to have a two-tail test. So when we shade, um, we will shade the p-values in both tails, okay? Because half of the p-value would be on this side and half would be on this side, but I'm not gonna shade it until after I run it in the calculator, okay? If you were doing hand calculations or if you have to show work, the formula that you use to find your standardized test statistic, which your calculator will calculate for you, is x bar one minus x bar two minus the difference that you're hypothesizing. So in this case, because we're saying that there is no difference, this part right here would just be zero. And then because we're not pooling, we use the sample size of the first population squared. So in this case, n1 is cats and two is, or sorry, let me make sure, um, one is dogs and cats is two. I knew as soon as I said that, that I mixed that up. Okay, so if you have to show work, basically all you're going to do is you're going to take the information from the chart up above and we would plug in our X bar one. So our X bar one is 252 minus 187. So this is going to give us a positive value. And then remember our differences in the two means is minus zero divided by, and then we would look at our standard deviation for both, so the 28, 31, and the 20 and the 24 is all I'm plugging in. And I'm not gonna plug this into, um, this entire formula into my calculator because remember we're gonna run the test in um, the TI-84. So let me grab my calculator and it will give me the answer to this, but this is just in case you need to show work because a lot of times you have teachers or professors that require you to show work. So this would be plugging in all of the information to show your work. So now let's grab the calculator. And where we're going to go is we're gonna to go to stat and over to tests and we're gonna find the two sample t-test, which is why it's important to know the conditions um, because there's a lot of options for different tests in here. So we want to do option four, which is the two sample t-test. So you have to know when to use them. Data you're gonna use if you have information to plug into your lists, which we don't. Um, so we're gonna go to stats and stats is what you use if you have um, the sample mean and sample standard deviation and sample sizes for each one. So I'm just gonna plug in all of these values. So X bar one, was 252, the sample standard deviation is 28, the sample size for the first population is 20, so that's the dogs. Um, the cats is 187, 31, and 24. And then this part is always determined by 
your alternative hypothesis if it's not equal to less than or um, greater than. So in this case, it's not equal to pooled. Remember that this you decide on depending upon if you know the variances are equal or not. If you do not know that the variances are equal, it's always safer not to pool. Okay, and then the color, if you have the choice to do a color, you can pick whatever color. And I'm gonna go ahead and draw this because it will give me both the p-value and the standardized test statistic, as well as show me a picture of what should be shaded. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit draw and it will give me all of the information. Okay, all of that was just found from the information that I had on paper. And if you look, you can hardly see anything being shaded. And that's because T is 7.3019, and on here it actually gives me a p-value of zero. And that's because it can't go out enough decimal places, so it actually rounded it to zero on this screen. Um, I'm gonna go back in and rerun it so that I can get a decimal approximation, but let me go ahead and write this down. So our standardized test st statistic is 7.3019, which has a p-value of essentially zero, which means that this is pretty much impossible to say that there is no difference between the two between these. Um, so from running it in the calculator the first way, I'm gonna go back, stat tests, I'm gonna run it again, but this time instead of drawing it, I'm just gonna hit calculate. So this will also give me the values. Notice this time it gives me 5.6 E negative nine. So the p-value is twice the probability of this occurring. So our t-value being greater than. So um, if you wanted to write this out, this is really two times the probability that t is greater than 7.3019, which ends up being approximately 5.62. And then the E negative nine, that's very important to understand what that means in your calculator. The E negative nine is scientific notation, okay? So this means times 10 to the negative ninth, which means that if I were to write this out, I would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight zeros before I have the five, six, two, which is why on the other screen it said the p-value was approximately zero because this is a very, very small number, very close to zero, okay? So when I shade this, I'm technically shading a p-value up here, but you can just barely see it. So that's why you couldn't see anything, because seven would be clear out here. There's barely any area shown, okay? So remember, our decision rule that we're using for this one is the p-value, and so we're gonna compare it to alpha. So to make your decision, you're gonna compare the p-value to alpha, and if we go back up to the problem, remember that our alpha level that they asked us to use was 0 0.05, okay? Um, so our p-value is essentially zero, okay? Um, okay, and we're going to see, I put an extra zero in there, so let me just move my decimal place to here and I'll erase that. Okay, um, so we're gonna compare this to 0 0.05 and we can see that this is definitely less than alpha. Anytime the p-value is less than alpha, so we can say since p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. So remember the two decisions that you make are either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. You never say anything about the alternative. Okay, um, so basically what we're saying is since our claim was that there was no difference between the two, that they're equal to each other, um, the alternative is that there is a difference, they're not equal to each other, so we rejected our claim and so down here we can write a sentence to explain this because that's always important to explain it. And when you explain it, you wanna explain it so anybody can understand it. If you start talking about p-values and alpha levels, nobody's gonna understand. So we can say at 5%, so basically I just took my um, critical value or my critical level, my um, alpha level, and changed it to a percentage. So at 5%, we have enough evidence to reject the claim.
Okay, and then you always want to put the claim in here so that anybody can understand. Um, so we would say that the mean annual cost for um, vet visits for cats and dogs is the same. Okay, so we have enough evidence to reject the claim that the mean annual cost for vet visits for cats and dogs is the same. Okay, then you can take it a step further because a lot of times you want to look at your analysis and see what's happening. So since there is a difference, you can look at the two and we can see that dogs are a lot higher. Um, so we could say from our sample, it appears that dogs are more expensive. Okay, the interpretation is the most important part of any hypothesis test because that's what you're gonna report to people. Um, the T values, those are mainly for statisticians to understand and the P values, um, those are for the statisticians to understand. This is the part that you would relay to somebody else to say your findings. That's the most important part of statistics is being able to say your findings to others. Okay, I know that this video was a little long and I thank you for hanging in there if you've made it all the way to this point. Um, just remember that once you get used to hypothesis tests, it does get a lot easier. There's a lot of things that go into it, but the mechanics are the same pretty much for all of them. You have to first start with what information do I have to point me towards the test that I'm going to use. Set up the null and the alternative. Um, write out your work if it's required. Otherwise, you can just run it in any kind of software. It's good to have a model with a picture and then you can use a p-value or a rejection region to make your decision, which I do have a video that shows you the rejection region. As always, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know. If there are additional topics you need me to cover, please let me know that as well.